Section One of Farewell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen. Farewell by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by Ellen Marriage. Section one. Come, deputy of the centre, come along. We shall have to mend our pace if we mean to sit down to dinner when everyone else does, and that's a fact. Hurry up. Jump, Marquis. That's it. Well done. You are bounding over the furrows just like a stag these words were uttered by a sportsman seated much at his ease on the outskirts of the forêt de l'île adam he had just finished a havana cigar which he had smoked while he waited for his companion who had evidently been straying about for some time among the forest undergrowth four panting dogs by the speaker's side likewise watched the progress of the personage for whose benefit the remarks were made to make their sarcastic import fully clear it should be added that the second sportsman was both short and stout his ample girth indicated a truly magisterial corpulence and in consequence his progress across the furrows was by no means easy he was striding over a vast field of stubble the dried cornstalks underfoot added not a little to the difficulties of his passage and to add to his discomforts the genial influence of the sun that slanted into his eyes brought great drops of perspiration into his face the uppermost thought in his mind being a strong desire to keep his balance he lurched to and fro like a coach jolted over an atrocious road it was one of those september days of almost tropical heat that finishes the work of summer and ripens the grapes such heat forebodes a coming storm and though as yet there were wide patches of blue between the dark rain-clouds low down on the horizon pale golden masses were rising and scattering with ominous swiftness from west to east and drawing a shadowy veil across the sky the wind was still save in the upper regions of the air so that the weight of the atmosphere seemed to compress the steamy heat of the earth into the forest glades the tall forest trees shut out every breath of air so completely that the little valley across which the sportsman was making his way was as hot as a furnace the silent forest seemed parched with the fiery heat birds and insects were mute the topmost twigs of the trees swayed with scarcely perceptible motion any one who retains some recollection of the summer of eighteen nineteen must surely compassionate the plight of the hapless supporter of the ministry who toiled and sweated over the stubble to rejoin his satirical comrade that gentleman as he smoked his cigar had arrived by a process of calculation based on the altitude of the sun to the conclusion that it must be about five o'clock where the devil are we asked the stout sportsman he wiped his brow as he spoke and propped himself against a tree in the field opposite his companion feeling quite unequal to clearing the broad ditch that lay between them and you ask that question of me retorted the other laughing from his bed of tall brown grasses on the top of the bank 
he flung the end of his cigar into the ditch, exclaiming, I swear by Saint Hubert that no one shall catch me risking myself again in a country that I don't know with a magistrate, even if, like you, my dear d'Albon, he happens to be an old schoolfellow. Why, Philippe, have you really forgotten your own language? You surely must have left your wits behind you in Siberia, said the stouter of the two, with a glance half comic, half pathetic, at the guide-post, distant about a hundred paces from them. "'I understand,' replied the one addressed as Philippe. He snatched up his rifle, suddenly sprang to his feet, made but one jump of it into the field, and rushed off to the guide-post. "'This way, d'Albon, here you are! Left about!' he shouted, gesticulating in the direction of the high-road. "'To Bayer and Lilladon he went on so if we go along here we shall be sure to come upon the cross-road to cassan quite right colonel said m d'albon putting the cap with which he had been fanning himself back on his head then forward highly respected counsellor returned colonel philippe whistling to the dogs that seemed already to obey him rather than the magistrate their owner are you aware my lord marquis that two leagues yet remain before us inquired the malicious soldier that village down yonder must be bayer great heavens cried the marquis d'albon go on to cassan by all means if you like but if you do you will go alone i prefer to wait here storm or no storm you can send a horse for me from the chateau you have been making game of me sissi we were to have a nice day's sport by ourselves we were not to go very far from cassan and go over ground that i knew Pah, instead of a day's fun you have kept me running like a greyhound since four o'clock this morning and nothing but a cup or two of milk by way of breakfast oh if you ever find yourself in a court of law i will take care that the day goes against you if you are in the right a hundred times over the dejected sportsman sat himself down on one of the stumps at the foot of the guide-post disencumbered himself of his rifle and empty game-bag and heaved a prolonged sigh o oh, france behold thy deputies laughed colonel de sucy poor old d'albon if you had spent six months at the other end of siberia as i did he broke off and his eyes sought the sky as if the story of his troubles was a secret between himself and god come march he added if you once sit down it is all over with you i can't help it philippe it is such an old habit in a magistrate i am dead beat upon my honour if i had only bagged one hair though two men more different are seldom seen together the civilian a man of forty-two seemed scarcely more than thirty while the soldier at thirty years of age looked to be forty at the least both wore the red rosette that proclaimed them to be officers of the legion of honour a few locks of hair mingled white and black like a magpie's wing had strayed from beneath the colonel's cap while thick fair curls clustered about the magistrate's temples the colonel was tall spare dried up but muscular the lines in his pale face told a tale of vehement passions or of terrible sorrows but his comrade's jolly countenance beamed with health 
and would have done credit to an epicurean both men were deeply sunburnt their high gaiters of brown leather carried souvenirs of every ditch and swamp that they crossed that day come come cried m de sucy forward one short hour's march and we shall be at cassan with a good dinner before us you never were in love that is positive returned the counsellor with a comically piteous expression you are as inexorable as article three o four of the penal code philippe de sucy shuddered violently deep lines appeared in his broad forehead his face was overcast like the sky above them but though his features seemed to contract with the pain of an intolerably bitter memory no tears came to his eyes like all men of strong character he possessed the power of forcing his emotions down into some inner depth and perhaps like many reserved natures he shrank from laying bare a wound too deep for any words of human speech and winced at the thought of ridicule from those who do not care to understand m d'albon was one of those who are keenly sensitive by nature to the distress of others who feel at once the pain they have unwillingly given by some blunder he respected his friend's mood rose to his feet forgot his weariness and followed in silence thoroughly annoyed with himself for having touched on a wound that seemed not yet healed some day i will tell you my story philippe said at last wringing his friend's hand while he acknowledged his dumb repentance with a heart-rending glance to-day i cannot they walked on in silence as the colonel's distress passed off the counsellor's fatigue returned instinctively or rather urged by weariness his eyes explored the depths of the forest around them he looked high and low among the trees and gazed along the avenues hoping to discover some dwelling where he might ask for hospitality they reached a place where several roads met and the counsellor fancying that he saw a thin film of smoke rising through the trees made a stand and looked sharply about him he caught a glimpse of the dark green branches of some firs among the other forest trees and finally a house a house he shouted no sailor could have raised a cry of land ahead more joyfully than he he plunged at once into undergrowth somewhat of the thickest and the colonel who had fallen into deep musings followed him unheedingly i would rather have an omelette here and homemade bread and a chair to sit down in than go further for a sofa truffles and bordeaux wine at cassan this outburst of enthusiasm on the counsellor's part was caused by the sight of the whitened wall of a house in the distance standing out in strong contrast against the brown masses of knotted tree trunks in the forest aha this used to be a priory i should say the marquis d'albon cried once more as they stood before a grim old gateway through the grating they could see the house itself standing in the midst of some considerable extent of parkland from the style of the architecture it appeared to have been a monastery once upon a time those knowing rascals of monks knew how to choose a site this last exclamation was caused by the magistrate's amazement at the romantic hermitage before his eyes 
the house had been built on a spot halfway up the hillside on the slope below the village of nerville which crowned the summit a huge circle of great oak trees hundreds of years old guarded the solitary place from intrusion there appeared to be about forty acres of the park the main building of the monastery faced the south and stood in a space of green meadow picturesquely intersected by several tiny clear streams and by larger sheets of water so disposed as to have a natural effect shapely trees with contrasting foliage grew here and there grottoes had been ingeniously contrived and broad terraced walks now in ruin though the steps were broken and the balustrades eaten through with rust gave to this sylvan thebaid a certain character of its own the art of man and the picturesqueness of nature had wrought together to produce a charming effect human passions surely could not cross that boundary of tall oak trees which shut out the sounds of the outer world and screened the fierce heat of the sun from this forest sanctuary what neglect said m d'albon to himself after the first sense of delight in the melancholy aspect of the ruins in the landscape which seemed blighted by a curse end of section one recording by martin geeson in hazelmere surrey